I'm Fred Stankis with my guest, I could say co-host, Suhas Ram Gindi, and we're going to be discussing uh, some of the uh, little uh, gems and treasures that Meher Baba has given us that was uh, calculated by uh, Bao Kalchuri in this uh, epic work. It's uh, the biography of the Avatar of the Age, Meher Baba, Lord Meher. And we'll be covering volumes two and three uh, from uh, the early years of Meher Baba. Meher Baba was born in 1894 and dropped his physical form in 1969. Uh, there is a interesting uh, page to begin this program with to give you some idea of some of the things that are covered in Lord Meher. And it starts with, Meher Baba stressed the importance of awakening early in the morning between 4 and 6 a.m. for meditation and then quoted this saying, During the first part of the night, most people are awake. During the second part of the night, before midnight, merry makers and gluttons are awake. And during the third part of the night, after midnight, thieves are awake. <laughs> During the fourth part of the night, before dawn, yogis are awake. <laughs> when one of the boys in the school asked for an explanation of how a yogi meditates, Baba commented briefly on the difference between the yogic form of meditation and what he had explained to Bhiva, one of the students at his school. There's a great difference between a yogi's meditation and sincere meditation on infinite impersonal God or the Guru, infinite God in person. A yogi's meditation ends in samadhi, or a trance-like state, while meditation done out of love ends in union with God. A yogi's meditation ends where love's activity begins. Well, Suhas, welcome. Thank you for that. And uh, now, do you fall into one of these categories? Are you the first part of the night? The second or the third or the fourth? <laughs> I think I might be in the first and the fourth. Oh, are you? So the first is most people are awake. Yes. And the second is uh, the you're awake part. before dawn. Yes. Uh, you're awake between 4 and 6 a.m. And what is the significance? Well, Baba had stressed that the best time to meditate is between the early hours before the sun gets out, like between 4 and 6. He used to, as a matter of fact, wake up some of his mandali at 5 in the morning and they had to take baths and everything and be ready to meditate before they started the day. So getting up between four and six has a, a, it's very quiet at that time. There's not much noise outside. And so it helps meditate, meditation. So at that time, uh, it is more uh, easy to focus on the internal, on the God within and so on, and to do the meditation. Even the hustle bustle of Los Angeles and the, I mean, I guess at that time of the morning, it's, it is peaceful. Yes. And so uh, it's good, I guess, to either meditate. Meditation can be, what in your mind is meditation? Is it just well, imaging or? Well, meditation can be a lot of things. It can be, reading can be meditation when you read on spiritual matters. It's a form of meditation because you're concentrating on a subject matter. Uh, Baba has suggested in one of his discourses on meditation that you take a photograph of him and focus on him for about five minutes and then read a divine theme which he has written down which explains how the soul progresses from being unconscious consciousness to conscious consciousness. And just by reading that you're able to focus on Baba 
and that helps you get closer and closer to him. You were mentioning as a youth, as a young boy of what, four or five years of age, you began to actually repeat the names of God a, a meditation at, at that age? Well, it was, I don't know, you. yes, and uh, when I was very young, I watched my maternal grandfather doing the beads and chanting the name of Lord Rama. And that's what we call Ram Jap, which means the chanting. How does it go? Ram. Ram, Ram, Ram. But you're counting with the bead every time you say the Lord's name. So Baba has said, now you take my name and you say Baba, Baba, Baba. And you try to do it as much as you can. And even when you're falling asleep, before you go to sleep, if you say Baba's name slowly and with feeling, you can wake up in the morning with that meditation going through your mind, like Baba, Baba. When you wake up, you wake up with Baba. He wants you to go to sleep remembering him, and he wants you to wake up in the morning remembering him. So that he has said that if you remember me at the moment you breathe your last, then you will come to me. But how are you going to remember him at that last moment unless you start remembering him from now on? So that was one of the techniques that was given by Baba, so remember him by saying his name before you go to bed at night and when you wake up in the morning. And if you can do it as, as regularly, then at least take his name once a day with all your heart. So do we have some more gems from the particular well, volume three? That was page uh, 1084. Right. And then uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, about uh, the explanation about the mind of 1081. If you okay, want to sure. Some yeah, why don't you uh, give us a okay, feel for well, that? Baba was explaining to uh, one of his students, again, Bhiva, um, Baba used to pay particular attention to a boy named Bhiva, often calling him to be near him and patting and kissing him. One day at 1.30, Baba gathered all the Prem Ashram boys. This was a school that Baba had started for special students. You know, that could be an entire students. subject oh, in sure. itself. The, this Prem Ashram spiritual training that yeah. uh, these uh, youth got uh, directly from their Baba. Exactly. They were, it was a spiritual uh, discourse as well as they got the regular curriculum of school. So one day at 1.30, Baba gathered all the Prem Ashram boys and asked whether they were having any problems meditating at night and early in the morning, what we just talked right. about. And many replied that they were not, but Bhiva, one of the boys, began shedding tears and did not answer. And Baba questioned him. After hesitating, Bhiva answered, while meditating, I don't see your physical form. Many thoughts assail me. That means you have a lot of other oh, things yes, in your mind. mind. And so Baba consoled him with an explanation about the makeup of the mind. He says, the mind is a terrible thing. It may be called a curse. Its business is to think and think. The more so when we do not wish to think of a particular person or thing. For instance, when you sit down for meditation or concentration on the guru or the master or beloved God, other worldly thoughts of a thousand and one kinds of which ordinarily you would not have dreamed of are sure to rush into your mind. And this is what happens with yes. a lot of beginners. Definitely. They're thinking and about then you get so discouraged. Yes. A lot of people do. So he says, thoughts always creep in with their continuous onslaughts, for it is the business of the mind to think, think, and think. The mind is constantly thinking, it's constantly working. And the objective of meditation is to slow down the mind so that you get at peace, meaning the mind at rest. So this is a good point to ask you, if, a, if this is for the viewers, sure. if a person has a problem beginning, uh, in other words, does it come through length of time of concentration, or just this try for what? How, how long would you say a person should be doing? Five minutes of meditation? Ten minutes? I think it's more the quality. It's also the depth of your intensity of uh, reaching out to the uh, infinite, or God. And so what you're saying? how sincere you are. Uh, I think that's what counts more, not the length of time. I see. That makes it could, like a, 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 yeah. an exercise. Yeah, it's a not an exercise like where you're doing uh, mental, gymnastics, mental gymnastics. Because you're going to keep saying the same name over and over again like a parrot and it wouldn't work. You have to have that feeling. 
So Baba said, even if you take my name once a day with great feeling, you still remember me. Ah, okay. So it doesn't have to be repetitious. But then he goes on and he says, but the real thinker and meditator is he who would not pay attention to these thoughts, these other thoughts that are swimming around, and would go on meditating on the image of his worship even amidst the strongest attacks. This intervention of other ideas is not a sin or a defect or even a mistake of the aspirant. These thoughts do and will come as long as that terrible mind is there. The aspirant has only to persist strenuously to drive away these as much as he can and think of the beloved God. He should not give up meditation or feel disturbed or disappointed by these attacks. This is what we were just talking about. Should he give up? Like we said, it's difficult to get going. But he should not be discouraged because it takes time. He says, he continues and says, you need not worry or cry that you cannot love when you cannot meditate due to other thoughts disturbing you. For don't you get up from your sweet sound sleep at midnight with the idea of doing meditation in the morning. That is half the work done. Sacrificing your sweet sleep for meditation of your own accord without any compulsion. I mean, you don't have to force yourself to do meditation, it should come naturally. So in other words, in your case, do you relish the thought of waking up at 4.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning to meditate? Well, now most it people comes... would say, you know, I need that extra hour or two sure. hours of rest. But that's why you have to make that effort. But this comes after a period of time of doing it, so that you're not doing it for the first time and saying, well, I'll try it for one day. I've been doing it for a period of time, waking up early. So it's perhaps the sublime, uh, you could say, feeling uh, yes. that you experience perhaps uh, may be what eventually is that which draws you to what is exactly. That's what I'm trying to reach for, that feeling that I, that I get of peace and calmness. So the rest of the day goes on better for me. Mm. When you first focus on the Lord before everything else, and you make that time for. Have you been doing this ever since your young age of of focusing on the Lord? I know before you you were in touch with Mihir Baba's life and, and come in contact with him. Uh, you were studying, like you say, Ram and so forth. Yes. But you always were a seeker. Even sure. before your father. Your father was uh, one of the foremost brain surgeons in all of India. Uh -huh. And he was busy with his profession. Yes. But you, at a young age, took to this without... It was your, it was your grandfather then who gave you that... Uh, well, I saw him doing it and kind of had a feeling for that. So I felt like maybe I should do that. It's not something that someone told me I have to do this. I just got a feeling for that and it was probably something that I was uh, geared to in this life. Maybe it was something I might have been doing in previous uh, lives that I may have lived. I have no idea. I mean, did you have fellow uh, friends uh, uh, you know, no. that, that did the same thing as you did? No, not no. to my knowledge. Really? It was something that I did on my own. My, amazing. It was something that I, and also was something that I wanted to do. It wasn't like someone said, go sit in the corner and meditate. No. You could just picture a young Suhas <laughs> sitting as a five-year-old doing <laughs> that. It almost seems uh, enchanting to, to think about. It is a way. Chanting is one of the ways of getting that thought of God within you. It, it sort of takes away all these other thoughts in your mind away. And what it helped me do was it helped me increase my concentration because you're focused on one idea, one objective. Taking the name of the Lord, you concentrate on him, but you also have to have that picture of him so that you have an object that you're looking towards. So I think uh, what I want to do was continue here for a little bit. And because he says half the work is done when you have that thought of doing the meditation. So he says, do you not try to sit down for hours until morning to meditate on me when others are in sound sleep? This is three-fourths of the work done. Now only one-fourth is left, that is thinking of only one thing, and try to do that. If you are successful, all right. 
If not, don't worry, says Baba. Three-fourths of the work has been done by your waking up and trying to sit for hours in meditation. So you have the work is done when you have that thought. It is no fault of yours if you do not get the image before your eyes. Because remember the boy had asked him about, he does not see the image when he's trying to meditate. He says, persevere and persist in your efforts. Do not be discouraged and give up the effort. Most people give up. Do not try to throw away the sitar because it is hard to chew. Oh, yes. A lot of people don't get started because they say, oh, this is difficult. <laughs> try to adjust and tune each string persistently with the firm intent of making the instrument work. Similarly, try to catch outside thoughts by the ear and throw them out. See, when you think constantly of Baba, one-pointedly, everything else stays in abeyance. Well, what I like here also, it says three quarters of the effort is just, just beginning to do it. Yeah. To get up and to prepare yourself to do it. Exactly. So it actually sort of relieves you the thought that once I get in that mode of sitting and in peace, mm -hmm. I only have one quarter to, to do, to finish. Yes. And that is just getting my mind quieted down enough to meditate, which, which actually gives you a nice feeling that if I can get up, just the thought of getting up to be in that position to perform it is, is, is three quarters of it accomplished. Well, the best example I can give you is like when you get up in the morning and you get ready to go to work. All that's preparation. That's half the work. When you get up in the morning, you get dressed, you put on your suit or your jacket, and you get into the car. You haven't got to work yet. But you're already preparing for that by going through those motions. Right. It's similar to that. Just thinking about doing meditation, like some people say, I gotta get to work by nine in the morning, you gotta get up at four in the morning. And after doing it for a while, it you begin to look forward and you wake up automatically around So that what time. you're saying that is actually a meditation then. It is a meditation. In other words, when you get up in the morning at a prescribed time, uh -huh. you know that your routine is to put the water on for the tea or coffee. Jump in the jump shower, in the shower shave. gum down, fix your oatmeal or sure. whatever eggs or whatever and toast. Uh -huh. And then read get the paper dressed. headlines if you sure. can. Dressed and you're on the road and you know and you know you have to be there because otherwise And it's amazing though how many people probably are meditating and they don't even consider it. They, but they are meditating on getting to work. So getting to work and getting dressed in the morning, all that is also a meditation or a form of meditation. Except you're not meditating on the Lord, you're meditating on your job, your external, ah, the worldly life. Yes. So. so that's the difference because you're moved by all these thoughts, as Baba said, the worldly thoughts that move around in your mind and make you think and think. You're thinking about your job, you're thinking about getting there, doing the best you can and so on and so forth so this is a good example what Baba says there now is suppose there are innumerable mosquitoes swarming around and some start biting you at night this happens in India where there's mosquitoes in yes. the uh, in the villages and so on because of the water the rivers and right. the streams what would you do to get rid of this annoyance would you just sit there and cry because the mosquitoes are biting you? No, you would at once get a mosquito net. <laughs> you would resort to a remedy and it eventually would have the desired effect. Even though the mosquitoes would come in hordes at first, you would not feel disturbed for they would almost all be outside the curtain, the mosquito curtain. Though a few might have come inside the net. Likewise, deal with all these thoughts. They, like mosquitoes, are sure to come and annoy you. But you have to put up a curtain of thoughts about me, says Baba, by letting my divine image be present before your mind's eye. That's why, remember I said you had to first focus for about five minutes on Baba's photograph and then read that divine theme, which gets you in the right frame of mind, just as I'm reading something right now. Let the mosquito net of meditation on me save you from being bitten by your thoughts. He says, meditate on me so that the other thoughts automatically stop pestering your mind. See? 
That's what we're just by focusing on one ideal. When you wake up in the morning, in my previous example, you think about getting to work. That's what's on your mind. Oh yes. Not about going to the movies or going to the beach or goofing off for the no, day. In fact, you're annoyed if somebody is in their household trying to talk about something. Exactly. Other than your, you say, wait a minute, I've got to get going. I've got to get to work. And so you say, many, I'll talk to you later about that. Sure. So many times, just as I was about to walk out of the door, the phone rings. <laughs> And somebody's calling me at the last list and say, wait a minute, I'm just leaving for work. So that's foremost on exactly. your mind. And this is this is the same type so of example you're saying if, for if, meditation. The folks would have that same focus for meditation as they do for dressing and getting to work. There'd be probably a lot of peaceful people out there. <laughs> it would make their lives a little bit peaceful. It would help instead of driving on the freeway frantically like today. Oh yes, like today. And, and, and anyway, continuing around, this is amazing how he said about the image. So he says to bring my image before your mind's eye. Think of me in various physical activities, going here and there, discoursing, giving darshan, kissing and embracing the boys, reclining on my seat, listening to records, etc. Just like what we do. Think of Baba doing all those things. And while you will thus see me in my activity, an image will surely come before your eyes. I see, so it's picturing him when he was so, talking to these young students as they saw him in his everyday activities because he walking, played uh, various games with them, cricket. marbles or cricket. Yes. He would be in the classrooms and he didn't say just look at me like uh, as though I'm a like statue. A still picture, but still but picture. see me moving see around, me moving, doing picture activities. Picture the flow of things. Exactly. Wow, that's amazing see him doing all these activities and while you thus see me in my activities an image will surely come before your eyes and no sooner than you get this scene let it not escape but have a firm hold on it in your mind and concentrate on it with all your affection. So you do have to have the feeling to You know, it reminds me of the word affection. If one would be meditating on his loved one, say uh, a wife or a lover, or, uh -huh. I mean, you would have that affection in the thought, wouldn't you? Of course. And that's the same kind of feeling. Uh huh. Thus, your meditation on my various activities will lead you to a concentration on my form. And you will then sit for hours concentrating on it. He says, remember what I explained, call to me and keep me in mind, and then meditate on my movements, gestures, facial expressions, and activities, whatever you remember. If thoughts interrupt, let them. Do not pay any heed. And then he said, I will teach some of the selected boys and a few of the mandali, the disciples, the methods of meditation. It should be done quite aloof from everyone. See, that's why you have to have your own space. Meditation should not be a troublesome burden or boring. It should give joy and be continued. And that's where we came to the beginning of this talk about the different hours. We're, we're running uh, sort of uh, fast here. <laughs> the show is moving along. We, I, I just was showing a signal for five minutes. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, so would, would uh, you, do you have something there or would you like me to bring up that seven heavens thing? Uh, a reference to the number seven? Okay. On page 998. Okay. Uh, uh, Baba was referring to the importance of the number seven. Yes. Which a lot of people always consider as a lucky number. And it's a spiritual it's a number. spiritual number, but he elaborated there are seven worlds that uh -huh. exist and and there are uh, actually, excuse planets. Me. There are seven worlds, planets in evolution. Uh -huh. In other words, these are planets in evolution. And then there are seven skies, which I, I mean those are things we could talk about. There are seven suns. There are seven moons, uh -huh. there are seven planes, and seven heavens in involution. In other words, that you ever heard of that saying, it's like seventh heaven? Yes. <laughs> so there is seven levels. Yes. And then he says, why this figure seven? 
And the impressions, too, are of seven colors. Yes, like the seven colors this, of the rainbow. Well, like they say, um, these people that can see your aura. Aura, seven see, colors of the rainbow. Exactly, they'll see colors if a person is very angry, a reddish sure, hue, reddish. or dark with bad gloom, dark brown, or black thoughts. In a, uh, but, the, but anyway, he says... Going all the way to purple. Right, he says, why? Because in the very beginning, when energy... Clashed with matter, Akash. Akash. It created seven divisions. Uh -huh. The explosive friction between energy and matter created seven dazzling colors. Uh -huh. Each individual human being is a universe unto himself. Uh -huh. In the head, there are seven openings. Name them. What, what does he say? There are two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and one mouth. I mean, think about it. Why was it? Then he would continue. And in the body, there are seven parts. There are two arms, two legs, two openings, front and back, and one trunk. Torso. Seven. But then he says, but all of this explaining of the universe and creation relates to the hair on your head and has nothing to do with the head. So first try to get hold of the head because out of it comes everything. So in other words, the amount of all these hair... Uh, the hair, Baba, compares to creation. It comes and goes. It's illusory. Your hair can grow again even if you cut it, but your head is always a constant because without the head, the hair has no place to grow. So he used that as an analogy to represent the head as the reality and the hair as the cosmic illusion that's always changing. Uh, what does he say? The barber's work... So he drew a figure of a man's head with hair and added the barber's work is to shave the head. And who is the barber in this case? Baba says it's Mahapralaya, which is the end of time or the destruction of the world as we know it. For when it occurs, all the hairs, the universes on God's head are shaven off. It is said that the universes pour out of the Godhead. They are like God's hair. Your head may symbolize God and your hair the universes. Uh, we've just given the one minute signal. Do you have a summary or something you just want to share before we wrap it up? Well, uh, I and just We're going to continue on with this. Uh, some more programs because this is very, very... I think we should keep something for another time. Yes. Because uh, um, we got to almost... Sure. Okay, well... So uh, until next time, Subhas, thank you very much for being here. And uh, again, um, much love to you all and Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Thank you.